The answer is for us to continue to come together. Right now, a lot of it is on the sand mining and on the fracking and on the, um, the pipelines. And uh, I constantly reminded as I travel through Wisconsin, when I go down 173, and on one side of the road there's a frack sand mine, and I know they use tremendous amounts of water, and I know they let that go back into the groundwater. And right across the road is a cranberry bog that sucks that water up in the process of cranberrying. So I've given that up at Thanksgiving. I don't do that anymore unless I know where they're growing and <laughs> happening. Um, Dave, yep. who's next? I didn't get a track sheet. It, okay, I'll introduce you. Okay, good enough. Well, thanks, Julie. Will there be a test on that? Oh, yeah. That's like a semester exam, I'll be, I would I'll say. I'll be in the hold of everybody. <laughs> Well, uh, <clears throat> thank you again, Julie. And uh, <clears throat> um, I am honored that uh, Carl Whiting has agreed to come and speak today. Um, he, he's done a lot of work um, on educating people regarding the Enbridge pipeline and the uh, tar sands oil that's coming from the Bakken fields up in Canada in the boreal forest up there. If any of you have seen pictures of it, you see this beautiful boreal forest. It just looks like a green carpet. And they literally go in there with bulldozers and they just scrape the top off of the earth. And uh, <clears throat> so, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's something that uh, we, uh, we have to start moving away from. I, I've heard it said this way, we're moving from the imperfect to the perfect. And yes, we all drive cars, we need we need fossil fuels for the time being, but we should always be looking to move from where we are to a more perfect place. So having said that, please um, give uh, Carl Whiting a big hand. Here you go. I did not pick the Rolling Stones for a backing vocal. And I can't think of a worse song than Brown Sugar to lead off to, but we will see if we can address that. I think just to drown out Mick Jagger with lyrics that are hopefully a little more hopeful, um, the people in this room, I know a good number of you from this fight, and I have to just say, I was talking to Phyllis Hasbrook, who will be, has already taken over for me in the Wise Alliance outreach and organizing uh, leadership position, that my favorite thing about this work is the people that I've met in it. The power of their intellect, the power of the deep heart and whole self they bring to this fight is the only thing that can wash over the kinds of facts that Julie just shared. Those facts are really important, really critical to know. Somebody has to be watching the store. Somebody has to know where we really are scientifically. And I think that if you have a presenter like Julie where you can hear the emotion in her voice, she's somebody who sees something like that falling apart and she wants to do something about it. And the people in this room are here Sometimes at some personal cost. Sometimes you get engaged in work like this and you have to explain to relatives or uh, make a decision about financial opportunities that you say, you know what, I want to do work that has real meaning. I want to do work that helps to heal the earth. And so what I want to do today is share a presentation with you about a specific subject, which is the pipeline expansion here in Wisconsin the Enbridge Corporation and their attempt to bring yet another pipeline through the heart of our beautiful state and the fact that we have been rolling up our sleeves to do something about that. And I would say that um, in talking with Bill Reindeer and his work on um, the pipeline issues from a really deep uh, center of himself is, is uh, work with Julie in meeting um, Bill um, Leichnam, who's on the, the board in Wood County, and meeting John and Andreezy and his uh, wife and their beautiful home and the warmth and the commitment that I felt there, 
in visiting, that is the stuff that sustains me and makes me feel that whatever they throw at us, this is why we're here. And whatever the size of the problem, I can't think of a more powerful resource to bring to it than the people in this room. You can speak, I've spoken to thousands of people, and I've speak, spoken to eight or ten people, and oftentimes a smaller, tighter group that knows some of the story and can work together with one another to build out beyond their knowledge base to be learners to one another, is it's just inspiring to be around. And so thank you for coming today. And I'm gonna bring my presentation, it's a little bit scripted because there's a fair amount of information, but it won't be dry and all, all just facts. It will really talk about what people are doing and how to get a handle on the issue and hopefully end on a hopeful note. I know that Bill's son John is here and he'll be speaking. I have to say his, the honesty and integrity with which he speaks is something that uh, really touched me up at the uh, Budare Ojibwe Reservation. And so uh, when you hear his words, and then finally with George Meyer, who's done such a, f a fine job with uh, DNR in the past, and I wish we still had that kind of leadership in, in that role now. But it isn't just about wishing, it's about using the tools that are available to us today. So I'm gonna go into my presentation there should be time afterward where if we have questions, I'd like to, actually Phyllis, so I don't forget, would you just stand up? Phyllis Hasbrook is the co-coordinator, that's a leadership uh, role in 350 Madison. She's going to be actively engaged in uh, connecting folks along the pipeline route, people with their own stories and their own local uh, energy that they can bring to the fight and trying to connect resources and um, different ways of addressing and thinking about the problem so that collectively we can really push back against this foreign pipeline giant who just sees us as uh, tar sands freeway and not as a healthy, vibrant state that needs to remain that way for our children. So let me get right into this. I have to say that I am not speaking today on behalf of Wise Alliance um, with Phyllis taking over that role, I am speaking as an individual uh, who's gonna be moving to the coast of Oregon and taking up environmental work there. My son was accepted to the University of Oregon and if you've ever seen the bill for out-of-state tuition, there's, there's a, a little push to get us out there, but uh, leaving this fight in really wonderful hands, not just in Phyllis's, but so many great people in this room. Okay, so, some of you have seen some aspects of this presentation before. I hope it's a little like stone soup. It gets added to with each new group I meet, each new person who brings something to it. Um, but we begin with the fact that this is a, a healthy forest in Alberta, Canada. It is part of a band of forests that stretches most of the way around the world, in addition to bears, moose, and many other animals. This particular section is the seasonal home for a third of North America's land birds and the nesting site for over 12 million ducks and geese. What's in a name? What you decide to call this beautiful forest land depends on how you look at it, what your relationship to it is. Some environmental scientists call this boreal forest. I understand the Ojibwe word is mekwea, or that's the best I can do. Tar Sands developers have their own name for it. They call it overburden, or the stuff in the way of what they're after. Because underneath this vast and beautiful forest is the Athabasca deposit, the largest known deposit of crude bitumen, or tar sands, in the world. If you scrape away this forest, or overburden, you turn this into this so that you can get a bunch of this. But remember, we're still stuck with this and so will the next generations be. This doesn't grow back. This can be seen from outer space. In 2012, climate scientist James Hansen told us that Canada's tar sands contain double the heat trap in carbon dioxide emitted in all of human history. If Canada proceeds and we do nothing, Hansen warned, it will be game over for the climate. So we fought the Keystone because it carried tar sands. And we won. 
Unfortunately, while the Keystone XL pipeline was making headlines, Enbridge was quietly turning Wisconsin into a tar sands freeway. Ask anyone in Wisconsin if they've heard of the Keystone pipeline, and then ask them if they know that we have a much bigger pipeline carrying even more of the very same dangerous stuff. Line 61 is the largest tar sands pipeline in North America. And the oil it carries is something new, something more toxic, and when it spills, we don't know how to get it out of the water. Remember this, the crude bitumen these corporations are after is a mixture of heavy oil, water, sand, clay, and other minerals. It is the dirtiest, most carbon emitting of petroleum fuels. And it requires enormous amounts of water to process, leaving vast toxic tailing ponds that stretch for miles. When geese and ducks land in these toxic lakes, they don't tend to take off again. And this happens far too often. And these pictures are painful, yet these are threats which must be understood. Bitumen is too thick to go through a pipe. It's like asphalt. So they have to mix it with barrels of diluent to thin it down. This thinning mixture contains benzene, hexane, hydrogen sulfide, and other cancer-causing chemicals. This stuff isn't oil in the sense we're used to, but a new mixture which is impossible in some cases to clean up. When the pipeline breaks, the thinning chemicals turn to gases, entering the air we breathe. Breathing in enough of these chemicals can cause health effects such as leukemia, nervous system damage, and fatal respiratory paralysis. I promise this presentation is not all bad news. Meanwhile, blobs of this tar sand sludge that is left behind begins to sink. Some of it floats below the water surface the way a fish would. The rest sinks to the bottom of any creek bed or riverway it happens to land in. The National Academy of Sciences completed a major study in February on tar sands oil. This is what they say about trying to clean it up when it spills in water. Submerged oil moving downstream in rivers or following wind or tidally driven currents, that's most waterways, could be intercepted in theory, but in reality, no techniques are known to be efficacious to capture oil beneath the water surface. In other words, once this stuff gets into the water, there really isn't a way to get it back out again. I couldn't stop thinking about those words as I was driving up here today. This is a picture I took a little further north, up at the Lucudere flowage up above Billy Boy Dam. This sacred place cannot become a dumping ground for a major tar sand spill. Like what happened to the Kalamazoo River near Marshall, Michigan. Geese and ducks look great painted on the sides of storage tanks. They look a little less great struggling on the banks of the Kalamazoo River painted with oil from the rupture of Line 6B and unable to fly. This Michigan disaster was the most expensive onshore oil spill in U.S. history, requiring over four years and $1.2 billion to clean up. And the EPA says it will never be able to get all of the oil out. Residents of the area can show you where it still oozes up from below the riverbed. Because Line 61 is so big, a spill could be much worse here. Just over a million gallons of tar sands oil gushed from Line 6B into the Kalamazoo River over a period of 17 hours. Line 61 here in Wisconsin could dump that much oil into the St. Croix or any other river in 30 minutes. And as the National Academy of Sciences showed, we won't be able to get it back out. With all that we are beginning to understand about the dangers of tar sands oil, why has Enbridge announced that they are now working to plan to twin Line 61? Yes, they plan to put another pipeline right through the heart of Wisconsin, actually right through the heart of Nakusa. This is probably the most populated region, most densely packed with houses on either side of the corridor that I could find anywhere in the satellite view from Superior all the way down to the Illinois border. They are calling the new Line 66, and if Enbridge gets their way, it will be the same size as 61, the largest tar sands pipeline in North America. The pipeline corridor through Wisconsin is already completely full, so Enbridge will need to take a major new strip of land next to the existing corridor, perhaps as much as 200 feet wide, 
and stretching all the way from Superior in the north down to the Illinois border. That strip of land contains hundreds of farms, houses, barns, churches already built there. What are these people going to do? These are overhead shots of the corridor where it runs through Nkusa and Lake Arrowhead. If the corridor is to expand to admit another major line, many of the houses in these shots will likely have to be destroyed to make room for it. Remember that this is a private company seeking private property, seeking it through eminent domain, and using our land in the state of Wisconsin for their benefit to our tremendous risk. We hope for a different future for Wisconsin, and that is why we came here today. Everyone can work to raise awareness of these concerns, and the members of Wisconsin's federally recognized tribes have an especially powerful voice in this pipeline fight. Here is one example of how that voice has been used. Although it may look pretty straight on this map, Enbridge's pipeline isn't quite as straight as it, in its march south as the company maps would like you to believe. When we traced the Line 61 corridor south from Superior to Delavan, we found something that caught our eye up in Sawyer County. A sudden change in direction in the pipeline corridor, right at the edge of the Lakota Ridge of Boy Reservation. The older lines, 6A and 14, crossed reservation land, but when it came to the massive Line 61 project in the late 2000s, something or someone had forced them to go around. So as soon as I got the chance, I drove north to the LCO Reservation, where Elder Mary Ellen Baker met me at her healing lodge. Mary Ellen was patient with my lack of knowledge about Ojibwe culture, and I can't thank her enough for that patience. If we're going to reach to one another, we have to reach to one another with patience. As we drove all around the reservation, she pointed out wild growing medicines where I had seen only bushes. She described the sacred connection of women and water as life-giving forces. Toward evening, a young black bear crossed the road in front of us. I'd been looking for a bear my whole life, and I'd never seen one in the wild. Driving around the reservation, everywhere around me, I began to see why one would feel such reverence for the water and for the land. I saw a deep care for children, for education but not for the Line 6A pump station. For that, folks didn't seem to care at all. In one of my travels north, I was invited to a sugar bush action camp in Minnesota, sponsored by Honor the Earth. Honor the Earth has been a powerful leader in this ongoing pipeline fight. We'd been invited out by Corey Northrup of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. On her business card, Corey told me that the snake symbolizes the pipeline. She described an Anishinaabe legend in which a black snake would come and threaten the land and that people would have to make a choice between two paths. At least on her business card, it was good to see who was coming out on top. Lorna, another of our hosts in the sugar bush, let me know that I was more of a jabberer than a worker. But she also taught me about the sugar bush and about fighting to protect the way of life. The learning in action camp was something we will remember a long time. This gathering of sap is a sustainable way to use this beautiful land. This exposed pipeline on the way to the camp is a broken promise to the land and doesn't match up well with Enbridge's rigorous safety claims. Whatever protective coating this was supposed to be now looks like a snake shedding its skin to reveal a long black body. Under the surface are many thousands of barrels of oil moving at enormous pressure, over a thousand pounds per square inch. What makes many of us in the fight the most hopeful are the wonderfully creative ways, like this bag of pipeline-free wild rice that we've seen to raise awareness showing us all how to fight, not just against something, but as the speaker who introduced everyone has said, for a way of life. And to preserve a food source that is also a source of cultural identity. If tar sand sinks to the bottom of these lakes, this wild rice will not be able to grow. This identity will be threatened. I want to thank Sarah Kalmanson of Honor of the Earth for bringing these bags to a Chicago meeting 
of groups of people from all around the Great Lakes who are working to raise awareness of Enbridge's pipeline expansion. We are gathering steam and fast. My bag brings me great hope, so I keep the wild rice unopened on my office desk as a symbol of what is possible. I had to buy another one so I could actually try some. When you put this manuman in the water to boil, your kitchen will fill with the fresh lake water smell from where it was grown. And for some time, I've been trying to figure Enbridge out, not the corporation, because that's not a real thing. I've been trying to figure out how people who were responsible for the largest sport spill in U.S. history would still continue forcing bigger and bigger pipelines across wild rice beds, across the Namaji, the Namakag, and the St. Croix, threatening the future of people who live along and fight to protect these rivers, who farm the land and work to keep this region healthy. And then suddenly it occurred to me, to Enbridge, our communities are the overburden, the stuff in the way of what they want to get at. Their plan is to push right past us, but that just isn't how democracy works. Pipes crack, oil spills, and eventually the light gets in. Our conversations with members of Wisconsin's federally recognized tribes have taught us that it is possible to fight for what you hold dear and to win. The volunteers of Wise Alliance are joining together with others across the state to say enough is enough. We are the proud dairy state a place where rolling hills shelter wild creeks and rivers. We are not the nation's tar sands freeway. It is past time to realize that we here in Wisconsin are now ground zero for tar sands transport. Determined to fight back, we're reaching out for new sources of strength, new partnerships with others who are committed to protecting our precious land and water that has much deeper roots than the pipeline does. I'd like to close with something hopeful. In the entire history of humankind, this may be the single most important generation because the pressing science on climate has made it abundantly clear, and Julie earlier made it abundantly clear, that we cannot burn even the existing reserves held by fossil fuel companies if we want to continue to live here much longer. Our relationship with this earth and her resources must fundamentally change and soon. And if we are going to turn this planet around in time, it will be in the span of this lifetime which will provide that pivotal moment. And we hobble ourselves when we describe this tremendous challenge only in the negative. Look at what we've been stuck with. This unprecedented issue can be seen another way. We have been given the opportunity to offer the greatest gift that any generation could possibly give the next, the simple chance to live a meaningful life on a healing planet. Considering the alternative, what gift could possibly be greater? Whether or not this will be achieved will be known in this lifetime. And here in Wisconsin, the new ground zero for tar sands transport, we are specially positioned to make a real impact on a global scale. What do I mean by that? I mean that the Athabasca deposit is like a, a big, uh, a reservoir of a poisonous drink. The straws come out of it, come right down through Wisconsin. You put a crimp in those straws, and the drink stays in the ground until we can get saner politicians who understand the science and we can begin to turn this planet around. There are few places in this world where a local population can have such an outsized role on something that will affect every human being across the face of this earth. And we in Wisconsin, right through these counties, right through Nakusa, right through my county of Dane, that's the straw. And what we showed in Dane County, what others are showing in other regions, are that you can put a crimp in it. In Dane County, we stopped a pump station from being built for over a year. By my calculations, no, actually by Enbridge's calculations, they said that put them back 300,000 barrels per day. That's almost $6 billion of tar sands that didn't make it into production that year. That's two and a half million cars off the road. What were there, 20 of us? And then some other folks who certainly helped out. But a core group that took that much of a bite out of this poisonous enterprise, the people in this room could turn things around for Wisconsin, but more than that, the people in this room 
could really fundamentally have a major role in turning things around for the planet. Because as James Hansen said, if we burn the Athabasca, that's double the CO2 so far released in human history and is unequivocally game over for the climate. But if we could leave it in the ground long enough for accords like Paris to begin to sink in, where politicians begin to feel heat, where if they don't understand, understand the science, they understand their own political livelihood, and they begin to see that more people have more knowledge and are willing not just to fight against the man, I like to fight against the man, but they'll stand up and say, my children and my children's children deserve better than this. And if the rest of you can't see it, I'm gonna keep talking, but I'm also gonna keep listening for where is the connection where I can help you understand the gravity of the situation and you can help me understand how to reach a broader audience. And there's nobody better positioned to do, to do that than the people in this room. I know, because I know you personally, many of you, and I've seen the personal stake that this has been for you. Bill Greendeer and Julie Delaterre in their sacred water, sacred land walk, they took some flack for um, a, how a logo was used, blah, blah, blah. Great, that's all, we can work on the details, but the fundamental thing is it's gonna take all of us. And everybody that's active in any way on this fight is a friend of mine is a friend of Phyllis Hasbrooks who will be taking over this role. And if we can work together and we can create a better argument, you might think, hey, well, they've got a ton of money. Well, actually, I close with, Enbridge has over $40 billion. We do not. But we have something more powerful than money. We have one another. And no amount of money can match our own stories, our own creativity, our own commitment, our spirit and deep concern for the earth, our own right to be here. You can feel it. You can feel it that if there's going to be an answer, it's going to come here. These are really, really good people. I am so honored to be doing work for very little money. I tell my wife, I sold the cow, but look at these magic beans. I'm going to go do similar work in Oregon, and we'll see what happens to the rest of our lives, but once you get into this, and once you feel it, and once you feel the integrity that other people bring to it, you just can't let it go. I know that there are those of you whose eyes are open in the middle of the night, thinking about your kids, thinking about your grandkids, wondering why the science says this, and the newspapers say that, or the deeply concerned, knowledgeable environmentalist says this, and the politician says that. We've got to bridge that gap and be the answer to that. Uh, tremendous challenge, but it is a challenge that I truly believe we can overcome. Wise Alliance plans to stand directly with impacted communities against this threat posed by the twinning of Line 61 to our land, to our water, and to our way of life. And we thank everybody who is already a part of that challenge and encourage those of you for whom this may be new information to connect with Phyllis Hasbrook. This is her email address. And together, celebrate what it means to be a fully conscious human being, doing everything you can to keep the opportunity for future generations alive. Thank you very much.